Okay, so the basic principle of flipping a classroom has been around for a while now. It actually started in high schools, uh, high school science classes, and has spread a bit more widely. And it became a lot more popular with the pandemic because it seemed to be, in some ways, an easier way of addressing some basic issues. And the, the basic problem that flipping the classroom is designed to address is that we know that lecturing is less effective in promoting than active learning and promoting both knowledge retention, what people remember, as well as the ability to take things they've learned and apply them in new concepts. So active learning is much more effective to do that. And that's not what most of us have done for most of the time that colleges have been around. But so in general, the notion of a flipped classroom is where you use active learning activities throughout the class. But one of the problems, particularly in disciplines where students expect lectures, is that students believe that lectures are more effective. There have been a lot of studies that have been done, both in controlled experiments as well as in, in larger studies and in institutions. There was one at Harvard not too long ago where they looked at STEM classes and they found that students universally thought that lectures were much more effective than active learning. Yet when they actually measured what students were learning, students that in classes that use active learning rather than lecturing, learn much more. But that's not the perception that students have. So I want to talk a little bit about what this is and how to do it. And one of the basic problems with lectures is at what level do they tend to generally be in terms of Bloom's taxonomy here? In theory, they can be at any level, but in practice, particularly in many of our classes, what do the lectures tend to get to? At what level in Bloom's taxonomy do they tend to focus on? Any thoughts there or? Oh, maybe evaluate, I don't know. I think remember and understand. You're saying how it is now with lecturing? Yeah, with lecturing, yeah. Yeah, yeah understand maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, understand and basic knowledge transmission, generally at a pretty low level. And what often happens, and I know when I first started teaching, especially in large classes, I was doing a lot of lecturing and you know, I started out really optimistic that students would do the reading I asked them to do before they came to class, but it became pretty clear immediately when I'd ask any questions or from the questions that students were asking that most of the students hadn't done any of the reading in advance. And what would often happen is we get into this site. What often happens for many instructors is you get into the cycle where you start off expecting students to come prepared to class, have done the readings you asked them to do beforehand. And then it becomes pretty clear that they haven't. So you start doing more and more of the basics, uh, the basic concepts in class at the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And then students come to expect that you're going to do that anyway, and there's no reason for them to do the reading in advance. So it's, it's pretty easy for lecture-based classes to end up at a pretty low level of content in, term, in terms of cognitive levels. Uh, Maureen. I was just going to quickly say this is partly, partly why I think students um, will end semesters often um, demanding that you provide, if, if you're if you're going to do an exam, that you're going to provide them with, you know, um, what is it that they're looking for? A Handouts, study, guide. study guides. Yeah. A study guide. And I'm like, oh my God, that's actually not the point. Like if I'm doing that for you, then we're still at, at zero. Right. <laughs> and, and so it's shocking, but I think you're right that this is kind of, uh, this is a natural result of what you're describing. And it's something so we take also, over the basics and then it disables everything else. And it's also what they've seen generally as they approach this, not universally, but that is pretty much the norm in secondary school education and in many of our classes everywhere, not just at Oswego, obviously. Um, 
but we'd like them to get a little bit higher. And those lower level things are the easy things. Those are the things that students can do pretty much on their own, that by reading a text, by watching some videos, they can get the basic concepts. Where students have the most problem is in trying to apply these concepts or analyze or evaluate things. And in a traditional lecture class, that's what we tend to do without being there to assist students, that we tend to do that either on assignments given outside of class, or we tend to do it when students are taking a high stakes exam often in many lecture classes. And so what's happening is we're basically giving students the easy things that they could easily acquire outside of class, and then we leave them on their own to do the more difficult things when perhaps our help and the help of other students might be a little bit more useful. So. The goal of a flipped classroom is to turn this around, to have students focus on the lower level concepts outside of class, but to do the harder work, the more challenging work to move to the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy within the class time using a variety of active learning techniques. And that will vary by discipline and many other things, but, but that's the basics of it, that we take the easy work, the, the work of understanding, you know, remembering concepts and being able to get to this basic level of understanding of the core concepts in the discipline to move outside of the classroom. And then we use class time to move to higher levels in the taxonomy. And um, so in a flipped classroom, there's, again, it tends to be based on active learning techniques. and. Um, well, I've already said all that. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we can do there. We could use a team-based learning approach, which is a very structured approach to active learning. You could use project-based learning or problem-based learning, where students work on projects that might be semester-long projects, or they could be shorter-term projects in groups, or they could be problem-based learning. And this has been used a lot in STEM disciplines, where you give students a problem and a series of steps they have to work through in typically in small groups to get to that. There's that whole scale-up program in the STEM disciplines that's been used very effectively even in large-scale classes where students work in small groups to work their way through a problem and then they share the results and so forth at the end of that. Um, and there's a whole host of active learning activities and there's lots of resources on that and we've done lots of workshops on that in the past. But basically that's the focus that we spend the class time where students are assisting each other in learning and students and we work with the students as well we wander around the classroom we help them we give them some reporting back after they work through problems and then we give them some feedback typically uh, and again how that works will certainly vary by the discipline and the level of the course and the nature of the course but that's the basics of this now, um, peer instruction is a pretty important component of any active learning approach. And it's, it's something that is very much supported by research. Um, I first became convinced of this about 15 years or so ago when I was at a presentation um, at a conference in the, um, I think it was in the Asynchronous Learning Network um, conference. No, it wasn't. But in any case, I don't remember the name. It was Carol Twig who was doing that program basically to um, try to teach large classes more efficiently. Um, and what happened basically is, well, one of the things I, I was present at was a presentation for a biology class that had taken, um, that had been using graduate TAs in the class. It was a large class. And then they switched. I'm getting a bit of sound, I think. Um, Maybe Karen, is that, let me, yeah. I'm going to mute you just for a second. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's a little bit of background sound from there. Just unmute if you'd like to pop in. Um, but what happened in that case was that they had switched from using entirely graduate TAs working in small sections to using undergraduate TAs. And what was interesting was that they measured the performance of everyone on a basic test at the start of before the class actually got underway on the first day of the class. Then they measured an overall understanding of biological concepts at the end of the term, but they did it not just for the students in the class, but they did it for the TAs as well. And what they found is that the students that worked with undergraduate TAs 
learned much more than the students who worked with graduate TAs. And they also found, though, that the undergraduate TAs learned the most from that whole process, which again, you know, that we probably all experienced as teachers that we really came to understand the basics of our discipline at a level we never reached before when we first started teaching it. Because in order to explain something to someone else, you really have to have a solid understanding in a way that allows you to make lots of connections to help other people make those same connections. So Peer instruction can be really useful in a large number of ways. And the basic argument here is that one of the things that happened as we become more proficient in our discipline, which is an issue that happened for the graduate students as well, is that when you develop a really higher level of understanding, much of the processing that you use is rather automatic, that you can make these connections, you can see a situation, immediately apply tools from your disciplines, concepts and models from your discipline, and that response tends to be very reflexive. And it's hard to understand why people who are new at this don't reach that same level of understanding, that it makes perfect sense to you and it's hard to reach out to students. It's, um, it's, it's hard to help students make connections when the connections are very obvious to you. But when peers have recently learned this or still are in the process of learning it, it's much easier for them to recognize the types of misunderstandings and misperceptions that other students are likely to have and to come up with ways of explaining it that works at that level of understanding in the discipline. So that's, that's one reason for this. And another is um, people or students often tend to take feedback from their peers much more seriously than feedback from their instructors because you know they want to they want to be able to show that they're well in term just in terms of I'm not sure the best way to put this, but basically in general, people tend to work very well with their peers because there's a level of mutual respect there that may not work in quite the same way when they're dealing with someone perhaps who's a bit older or who may seem a little more distant. Um, and when they see their peers understanding it, students who are a year or two older, it provides a really nice positive role model, especially when they talk, when peer instructors, uh, when the peer instructors, if you're using undergraduate TAs, when other students, well, peer instruction doesn't have to involve undergraduate TAs, but when other students are able to explain a concept to you, it gives you more confidence that you're able to reach that understanding in a way that it may not be as clear when you have this person up in front of the class who has been doing this for a while and has some level of expertise, and they, that seems a lot more distant. But when you see other people who are sitting next to you in class who can explain these concepts, it makes it it gives you a, something to aspire to in a way that might not work quite as well. For whatever reason, peer instruction works extremely well in helping students learn. So if you are the student who understands it better, you reinforce your learning when you explain it. If you don't understand it as well, you tend to learn it more effectively when you work with peers. Plus, it, it gives you a lot of leverage, especially in a large class. If everyone in the class is helping each other explain it, it makes the work a whole lot easier for you. Um, an example I've mentioned many times, and some of you may have heard when Eric Mazur was here, is the way he developed his techniques for peer instruction was that he kept trying to explain a concept to students. He was using clickers and they kept getting it wrong over and over again. And no matter how he explained it, it didn't work. And then he said, well, why don't you try explaining it to each other? And they did. And then he used the clickers again. And all of a sudden the scores went way up that the peer instruction was much more effective than his own instruction, despite all of his teaching awards and years of experience in explaining these concepts. So it's, it's something that when we can leverage it, it's very helpful. Um, and another thing that a flipped classroom allows you to do is to do just in time teaching that in general, we don't always know what a particular group of students will understand and what they don't understand. And a typical, in most flipped classroom arrangements, we're getting feedback on what students understand and don't. It could be through polling, it could be through some other technique, but when we get feedback on what students are having trouble with, we're able to focus the class time more efficiently on the things that students don't understand. And we don't have to spend as much time on the things that they really already do understand. And that's one of the areas where clickers tend to come in really handy. They can tend to be really useful because 
you know, even if we just ask students questions, we only hear from typically one or two students at a time. When you use polling techniques, you get to see how everyone is doing. You know, if the if the few students who respond when you ask a question happen to be students who are the only ones who understand it, you get this false impression that everyone has mastered this. On the other hand, if the only students who are asking questions or responding to questions are the one or two students in this big class who are confused and everyone else wants to move on, then you may get bogged down on things that may not be the most efficient use of the class's time. So using a flipped classroom approach, particularly if you're doing some type of polling or some other way of getting responses from everyone, allows you to use class time much more efficiently. Um, some examples. Um, this, is, this is my favorite example, actually. Um, unfortunately, they don't do it anymore. But um, at San Jose State, uh, they had a circus and electronics course. Um, and actually, it got shut down because of faculty resistance, but they had a circuits and electronics class that had an incredibly high failure rate. And the instructor decided to try a flip classroom approach. And he worked with a MOOC that had just been developed. I think it was an edX MOOC. Um, and the passing rate originally was 51%. And then he had students for the flip component, instead of creating Instead of the instructor creating his own content for the class, he had them sign up for an edX MOOC that was based on the same material. And then students worked on that using the MOOC in terms of watching the videos, answering, uh, working with, um, working through problems in there, submitting quizzes and practice uh, quizzes through there. And then they just present a certificate saying they had completed it. But then all of the class time was taken away from the, that lower level development, which was done by the MOOC. And they spent the entire class with the same number of TAs the instructor had before solving problems, working through problems in groups, and then going over them. And what happened after that was a passing rate jump from 51% to 91%, which is a pretty compelling argument for a flipped classroom approach. And it didn't involve any more work for the instructor. It just now, instead of lecturing in the class and having students occasionally work through problems at homework, they were doing that work in the class and going over the basic concepts outside. Um, they stopped it because of concerns about the use of a MOOC for core content materials in the class. And there was some resistance uh, in the faculty. And so they shut down that program. But I think it demonstrates the gains that can be had from a flipped classroom. Eric Mazur in physics found learning gains of about 200% when he introduced a flipped classroom environment where he has students work in problems from most of the class. He'll do short little lectures on concepts, but then he'll have students work on problems and he, he polls the students and so on. Um, and well, actually, I'm sorry, it was uh, Carl Wyman who found learning gains of 200%. Um, Eric Mazur actually found a 300% learning gain. And the way they measured it was specifically with a concept test called the force concept inventory, where students would take this before they went over the material, then they work through the material, and then um, they'd be tested again, and the learning gains were three times as large in the sections that used a flipped classroom approach as in the classrooms that use a traditional lecture approach. So it was a pretty dramatic gain. And in, in chemistry, um, Carl Wyman and others found a doubling of the scores. So the whole distribution shifted far over to the right. You know, the, the weakest students were doing better than the top third of the students after this flipped learning approach was used. I had done the same thing at Oswego, and before I introduced this approach in my large intro class, the average students in the class were performing about average, both at the beginning and the end, on a standardized measure of student performance. And then after introducing this, um, the median student was performing at about a 70 percentile, 65 to 70 percentile, um, sometimes a bit higher. Um, Actually, it was up to about a 75th percentile. It's dropped a little bit recently, and it dropped a lot last semester. But I think that was a pretty much universal problem in many of our classes. Um, and it, students don't like it, I should note, that students find this a lot more work because when they sit in a lecture, everything seems to make sense. Instructors can put things together in a way where it all fits together logically, and then students take a test and 
they have problems with it, but they can say, well, this test was really tricky. But often the problem is they just haven't developed the level of understanding that we'd like them to have. And if you're having students work on problems in class, their misunderstandings become revealed immediately. The advantage is you can address them immediately and you can give them guidance and correct them and keep them on track better, but it doesn't feel as good as sitting there and having everything make sense. So you really have to sell the technique to students. And I haven't been entirely successful on that. Um, one of the things that people who use clickers and use a flipped classroom approach often hear is, I have to teach myself. Why are we paying this professor when I have to do all the learning myself? And, you know, I address that with them. I say, well, you know, I can't do the learning for you. I did it myself. Um, now, you know, it is work to learn and you're going to make mistakes, but you can learn from that. Um, and as Maureen noted, coherence can be overrated. Um, and in fact, um, Carl Wyman had a fairly classic essay on that where he said, before he started learning about how students learn, the lectures that he gave that were most that he thought were the best lectures he had ever gave were often perhaps the least effective lectures because when it all makes sense and you don't have to wrestle with the material you tend to forget pretty much all of it really really rapidly the more you work and engage with the material and the more you try to find applications and the more you explore the boundaries of your knowledge and where you understand things and where you don't, the deeper your learning tends to be and the longer you'll tend to remember these concepts and the better you'll be able to apply these concepts in new circumstances. So, you know, I've never been entirely successful in selling this to students. My course evaluations have gone down ever since I've done this. But, you know, you don't have, I've tended to move to a completely flipped model, but you don't have to do that. Um, you can do it where you do a bit more lecture and so forth. Um, I know Liz in economics hasn't moved quite as far as I have, and she refers to it as more of a tilted than flipped approach and so forth. Uh, and yet, of course, and teacher evaluations are often overrated. Um, and there's all sorts of problems with those, with bias, with with gender bias, with racial bias, and a whole host of other factors there. And also, you know, it varies with the course you're teaching and the size of the class and the discipline you're in. And yeah, there's there's far better ways of evaluating people, but but all of them are much more resource intensive by having people sit in and do peer evaluations and other measures. And you know, so we we do rely on them, unfortunately. Um, but again, most departments, I think, have moved from just using course evaluations to doing at least some peer evaluation and other procedures, uh, as well as examining syllabi and, you know, assignments and other factors. So that helps provide a bit more balance in the process. But, um, you know, being tenured, it's a whole lot easier not to worry so much about course evaluations. But, but I think a more serious point is we do want our students to understand that we're not doing this to shirk work because we don't want a lecture, that we're doing this because research shows that this leads to dramatically more learning, even though it may feel a little bit more uncomfortable at times when you realize that you don't quite understand something. But it's a whole lot better. And the, again, I make this argument very often is it's a whole lot better to realize that you don't understand something when you're not getting graded on that, that, you know, the worst time to discover that you really don't um, understand something is if you're taking a somewhat higher stakes exam. It's much better to do it while it's being discussed on problems in the class that may not be graded at all, or that may have a very low stakes, or if you're working on practice problems that you can do over and over again, you know, online, it's much better to do that than to realize that you have these gaps in your understanding when you're taking a, a bigger exam or a larger writing project or something similar. Okay, so um, I guess any comments or questions or thoughts? I'm doing more lecturing here, which is kind of yeah. off. <laughs> and I think <laughs> what's interesting for me, so I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts, and my background is design studies. And through the process of design, a lot of it is those higher tier types of learning, because you're really kind of going through a process um, and, and really trying to uncover um, the issues there. And so it's just really interesting. And I there was always this idea, too, of, of looking at, you know, how do we get arts and artists more engage with other disciplines because the way that they think and break down problems. Uh, so no, I, I love it. This is great. Thank you.
very eye-opening. And I think the other part too is a lot of what we do here at OBCR is professional development, non-credit training. And so this really, I think, is really how adults prefer to learn. So this is uh, good stuff. So thank you. Adults do tend to appreciate active learning techniques more than our, our freshmen in particular, but Maureen? Um, I just have a question. Uh, you could address it, but maybe others would like to as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in that uh, pyramid, I, I was looking to see where there is any kind of reference to recursive um, uh, measurements, because I think for, for me in teaching writing, uh, I suspect Eileen uh, has this experience too. Uh, sometimes the, the issue is not so much what happens uh, with the first draft, but how students can really tr transform it and how you build that bridge from the first to the second. And, and that's actually, I think, something that's, there's a lot of writing about, but it doesn't really show up in our teaching very well. So I just wondered in the pyramid, where would you locate that? Everywhere. Okay. <laughs> that, that basically the pyramid is these levels you want students to get to, but in any assignment, there's going to be a mix of things that, you know, even if you're trying to elicit evaluation, it builds on all those lower levels. And in order to reach those higher levels, you have to iterate and practice all the way through that there is a process of development from the basic concepts or the basic skills up to higher level skills. But those higher level skills integrate all of those lower level skills as well. That, you know, if you don't, you're not going to be able to evaluate anything using the tools of the discipline if you don't understand those basic concepts, if you can't apply them in new framework. So, you know, it's it's all connected in a sense. And it is a recursive process as as students develop the skills within any of those categories, it does take practice and feedback and and so on. Does that well, my sense is that they they interpret recursiveness as a sign of failure, both ours and theirs, right? Yes. And so, you know, I, I just put in, I put the famous Samuel Beckett quote in a syllabus last night, you know, try again, fail again, fail better, uh, because I think that's a real issue psychologically is to embrace the failure, right? And, and that's a big part of this, that we have to convince students that you learn by making mistakes. And, and there is research that, you know, for example, when clickers are used and students get a question wrong, they're more likely to remember the correct answer if they get it wrong the first time. If they get it right, they're more likely to forget it more quickly. And I mentioned that to them. And I said, you know, we learn by making mistakes. Think about when you first rode a bicycle. You may not have quite ridden that smoothly at first, but you try something, you make a mistake, you learn from that, and you get better at it. And it's a continuous process. And that's true. In, and that's true of progress in any discipline, too, that, you know, we we start off with some understanding, we find things that don't work, and then we try to come up with better models that will explain those things. And it's this process of making mistakes and learning from it, you know, that's what progress in any discipline is about. But, but again, it doesn't feel good. And it's, and students don't like to get that sort of negative result back that, you know, they, they would like to be successful all the way through, you know, but it's, it's important to convince them that part of the progress is learning from things that didn't work. And, and emphasizing that I think is really, really important because it's not something that comes naturally to our students. And that fell better approach is a good way of, of, of doing it. Any other thoughts on that? I like in my copy editing class, um, when, we, when I teach headline writing, and I, we can do it together as a class, or I can show them one of mine, and they see, oh, it took five tries to get it right. And even then, we may be deb debating about a word. And uh, they feel the pain of how hard it is to write a headline that fits a space. So I, I think they get it. Yeah. Yeah, and when you can use an example of your own work where this has happened and you've made mistakes or you've, you've improved your work through that process of recursion and, and revision, that can help. Okay, so if we're going to flip a class in, how can we do it? Uh, well, any other, I'm sorry, any other, I don't wanna cut the discussion short, this, I just tried packing in a lot of stuff in here. Okay, I'll 
if we do want to provide students with the material outside of class, how can we do it? One way is we could create our own. That's the harder way of doing things, but it's one that many people have been doing and so that people have been doing for quite a long time. And also um, that many people have been doing, especially since the pandemic. I think more faculty have created videos in the last few years than I've ever seen happening before. And it is more labor intensive than using work that have been developed by others, but students do tend to value it, that students do appreciate and tend to focus more on lectures and or videos that faculty have their own faculty have created than if they assign a video created by some other faculty member out there on YouTube and so forth. So it does create a little bit more sense of your presence in the class when they're working outside of class. Um, and there are some, but the alternative is you could use materials out there that in pretty much all discipline, if you search on YouTube, you'll find most likely dozens or hundreds of videos that might go over the concepts that you want students to acquire. Um, want to just go over some ways of creating your own first, some basic tools. You know, on at As We Go, one of the easiest ways of doing this is using Panopto, and we've done lots of workshops on that. And I think a lot of faculty have used this. You can download it to your computer. You just basically put up whatever you want on the screen. It could be a PowerPoint. It could be images. It could be um, anything that you'd like to display, anything that you'd be sharing if you were doing a lecture. You just have it on your screen, you record it with a voiceover, maybe with a little um, video box on the screen, and, and then you just click record at the beginning, you click stop at the end, and it will automatically upload that video right to your, your course shell. Currently Blackboard, next fall it'll be Desire to Learn. And that's really easy to use. Now, one of the questions that comes up with that is, do you wanna have that little talking head? And the research on that is somewhat mixed, that in general, using eye tracking software, they found, it's been found that when there is a, when there's a, your talking head on the screen, it tends to result in more continuous attention and focus on the screen than if it's not, if you're not there, um, if the, only your voice in the screen is there. On the other hand, the negative part of that is most of the, eye tracking tends to be focused on your head rather than other things that you might be presenting on the screen, which may or may not be appropriate. Perhaps, in other words, if you're displaying images or passages from a text or a poem, or, or if you have some sort of visual display, some diagrams, you might want students to be focusing on that part of the screen rather than on your facial features as you're speaking. Um, so, one option that many people suggest is that if you're just talking directly to the students and you don't have other content to display, having your head up there talking does create a little more sense of instructor presence and does seem to maintain focus a little bit better. But if you want the focus to be on something else, it's probably better not to have your talking head up there. And some, what some people do is they'll just have an image of themselves talking at the very beginning and maybe at the end, and then the rest of it will just be the voiceover for that. And that's pretty easy to do with Panopto or other tools. Um, or you could just do it without that. And I used to put my, my head up there a lot, but I've become a little bit more of a, since I've been doing the podcast, I've become more of a perfectionist with audio. And so then I end up editing the ums and the you knows and sort of kind of the filler words out. And if I was to do that with a video, either my lips would be moving and there'd be no sound, or there'd be these jump cuts with me. It would be sort of like the old Max Headroom, if you remember that, uh, that imagery. So, um, I tend to do most of what I'm doing, unless it's just a very direct thing where I'm talking to students. Um, I just tend to have a voiceover. Um, but there's a, oops, that's not quite what I wanted. Let's go back there. Um, so that's one tool. Another one, which is kind of nice, is Screencast-O-Matic. Um, it's, um, you could, the basic version is, is, is okay, but it really doesn't add much more than Panopto. Um, the problem for me, at least with Panopto, is that editing with it is extremely limited. Pretty much, if you could, 
The only things you can easily do with it are trim off the end and the beginning of videos. If you want to do anything more sophisticated with that, you probably want to use something different. Screencast-O-Matic is something many people have been using. Uh, if you want the full editing features, it's either $1.50 a month or $4 a month if you even want more, if you want background um, Creative Commons music or music they provided, video clips, transitions, and other things. You know, it's it's a pretty inexpensive package. And certainly for $1.50 a month, it's it's I think it's worth it. Um, what I actually use myself is Camtasia, and if you're going to create a lot of videos, you might want to consider seeing if your department can come up with that. Um, it's I think the first purchase is like a couple hundred dollars, and then it's like $50, $60 a year after that um, for upgrades. Maybe it's a little bit more. One other tool we have is Adobe Premiere, which is available to anyone on campus through our site license. It's by far the most powerful video editing package. But because it's so powerful, it has a little bit of a more challenging learning curve that if you really want to use Premiere, it's, it's wonderful. And we have some great resources that you can use for tutorials. I find it a little bit cumbersome to use. And the only time when I normally use it is when, we're, when, we, when we actually have guest speakers in person as we used to do, and we have multiple cameras. It's really good for multiple camera angles where you can switch from camera one to camera two to camera three and do all sorts of really powerful editing tools, uh, editing techniques. But, you know, Screencast-O-Matic, Panopto, and Camtasia are really intuitive. They're designed for, for non-experts like me uh, who just want to create some quick videos. Um, and it keeps going, jumping over there. I'm not sure why. Okay, um, I must have hit the links. Okay, um, Adobe Spark is another tool that's free that works on iPads or desktops. Um, Screencastify is something if you happen to be using uh, Chromebooks or if you want students to create books, uh, create books, create videos, then this is a tool that'll even work on a Chromebook. And it's very similar to Screencast-O-Matic. Um, for people who have iMacs or uh, for have Mac computers or iPhones or, um, or iPads, iMovie is a really powerful editing package to create videos. You could just do a voiceover, you could do a slideshow, or you could just, you know, take images of things or videos and put them all together. And it's got some really easy to use and, and powerful tools. Um, and another thing you can do is if you don't want to load anything, I just want to record a, a, a quick um, video, you can do a screen recording of whatever's on your screen by just doing shift command five on a Mac or um, on Windows, uh, the Windows key alt and R and so forth. And both iOS and Android devices also will do a quick screen recording. So if you want to demonstrate a program or how to log into a site or something similar, you could just start a screen record on whatever device you're using. And then there's usually a button that you can use to stop the screen recording and it will save it to your clipboard on whatever that device is, and then you could upload it directly. So if you don't want to load a program, you can just do it pretty easily on most devices now. So those are the basic tools. Um, but um, what many people have used, because we've gotten so familiar with it recently, is Zoom. Right now, everything that we're anything, everything that's happening is being recorded in Zoom. You could do the same thing by going into Zoom, click on record on this computer or record to the cloud, and then stop the recording when you're done. And it will create a video that you could then upload to YouTube, or you could um, you could post a link to it in Blackboard or desire to learn or whatever. Um, and, you know, that's, that's probably the, one of the most common ways that people have been creating videos. So any questions or comments or thoughts on this? I have a question. Um, it, this is exciting, but it makes me think that um, a, one of the major strategies for addressing content basics uh, is through video. And um, that's not and always just, true. Yeah. OK, I, it's like, it makes me a little bit nervous just because of my own technological limitations. And I have a kind of aversion to being on camera. So uh, it's already enough that I'm zooming all the time. Um, so I, 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 you know, I just I'm interested also in the alternatives to 
uh, this kind of thing to in order to achieve a flipped classroom? Okay, well, the first part I wanted to talk about, well, let's, we'll come back to that. Um, well, and there's various more blogs, but um, well, let's just finish the video and then we'll talk about other ways of doing the same thing because it doesn't have to, it could all be text-based. You know, text-based learning has been going on for quite a while and has been pretty effective for centuries. Um, but if you're going to create videos, don't spend, don't try to create like an hour or 50 minute or an hour and 20 minute video, keep them short and focused because that makes it a whole lot easier. People can pay attention you know, more closely. And, you know, in a lecture format, we were constra constrained to those things because that was a class time. But, you know, if you have, if you have a material that you would have spent 15 minute lecturing on, maybe break it up into two or three, five minute videos or 10 minute videos, because if the, the videos are focused, you know, you don't have to spend as much time going through problems and so forth. One of the most least useful things for students is to take class recordings because class recordings have lots of pauses in them, lots of gaps. The transitions aren't, you know, are often from one topic to another. Um, and you're asking students questions, you're taking questions, and you can make a shorter video that's much more focused. Um, keep the workload sustainable. Um, you know, the videos don't have to be perfect, which probably what research shows tends to be most important is that your voice is clear, that if you have it, you know, so record in an environment that's fairly quiet, where there's not a lot of background noise, um, and having clear audio is much more important than clear video, because you know, students are often watching these on mobile devices, and no matter how clear the video is, or you know, even if the video is a little blurred, when you're watching it on a five-inch screen, it's going to look pretty sharp compared to, you know, what they'd be seeing on a large screen. Um, and another thing is, if you're going to create videos, you know, focus on the things that are reusable to the most part. Don't mention dates or current course activities so that you can repackage them in later semesters. Um, and another thing you may want to do if you're using videos is to embed quiz questions in some of those. That's one of the workshops later today. But um, by doing that, it'll make it more likely students will actually watch it, especially if there's a grade associated with it. You know, um, that the first time I saw this, I was taking a MOOC on behavioral economics a number of years ago, and it certainly forced me to pay a little bit more attention to the videos when I knew every three or four minutes there was going to be a question on the concept. Sometimes it was a question about something that was just addressed. Sometimes it was asking, you know, the, the person watching the video what they predicted would happen as a result of some experiment that was done. And then the result was revealed and it tended to increase engagement quite a bit. Um, so, you know, it's a good way to encourage people to actually engage with the videos. If they know they're going to be asked something about it, that tends to be a really good way of keeping student attention on the video if you're going to use videos. Um, you could also do that again by giving a quiz. You could have a Blackboard quiz. You could ask questions about it in class. You could do something the next day. Um, but having some sort of question or some sort of accountability encouraging students to actually watch the videos and focus on those can be really helpful. Um, now, before we get back to Maureen's question, you know, you don't have to create your own videos. You can, there's a tremendous amount out there on YouTube. In several disciplines, there are crash course videos um, put together by uh, John Green, his brother, and some other people who have been working with them. And those are really high quality productions that are very focused and very, in general, very well structured and designed using some really good learning principles. Um, Khan Academy has some videos which tend to be pretty close to lecture type videos, but they've been found to be pretty effective. And there's a site called TED-Ed where you can mix together videos and embed questions and you could use ones that other people have already created within your discipline. Um, Another thing you can use, and this wouldn't apply so much in, in cre creative writing and many other disciplines, but in, in STEM fields, 
there's often adaptive or personalized learning sy systems, which will essentially guide students through the basic concepts in the discipline by focusing on, by testing them, and then developing a customized learning path, which allows students to develop those areas that are weakest for them. So if a student comes into a calculus class, understanding um, you know, certain types of differentials, for example, but having trouble with integration, they'll be able to breeze through the parts on derivatives, and then they'll, move, they'll get more feedback and more learning materials and more practice on the things where they're struggling with. And again, that's primarily relevant in the STEM disciplines. Um, Malo is, I, I forgot what the acronym stands for, but it's a learning object repository where people have been creating things for about 20 some years now for online learning and sharing them publicly with other people, generally releasing them under some type of Creative Commons license. Um, and there's also a lot of MOOCs that have been created that are open that people can use resources from. One of the conditions in SUNY of getting back when there was funding for this up until the um, pandemic, one of the conditions for getting an IITG, the Innovative Instructional Technology Grants in SUNY to create a MOOC was that everything that you created had to be released into, uh, had to be publicly shareable under a Creative Commons license. So any of the SUNY MOOCs that have been funded in that way have videos and tutorials and other modules that can be freely adopted by any instructors who want to use any of those materials in their courses. Um, and there's a lot of open courseware sites out there. Um, now, going back to Maureen's question, you know, the assignments could be to read something. It could be to um, it could be to compare different readings and contrast them. It could be um, could be to attend a play. It could be to watch a video, to watch a movie or watch movies and then to come in and do some assignments on that in class or maybe even to do some sort of write up of it, you know, as an assignment. Um, it could be att attending a music performance. It could be attending events on campus. It could be any number of things that are done outside of the classroom that then they're going to be held accountable for in some way where they write up a reflection, a reflective log or something similar. Um, I'm not sure if that fully addresses it, but you don't have to use videos. Um, most of the original flipped classroom approaches were done in STEM classes where there is, you know, a, a body of content with equations and diagrams and so forth that can be more easily adopted to a video framework. But but it, it doesn't have to be, you know, in, in music classes, if it's a performance thing, it could be just practicing the instrument or recording your own practice of the instrument or reflecting on that. Or there's any number of things that could be done as the activities outside of the classroom. The key is to keep the activities outside of the classroom at the basic levels, you know, just to do the basic practice and then to focus on the more challenging tasks in the classroom where there's a chance to build on that and to, to assist students when they most need assistance, where they're more likely to be struggling with materials. Any other thoughts on that from anyone? Okay, well, some in-class activities. Um, actually, this is something that Rebecca and I put together a while back. Um, we, we did this near the, I forgot, somewhere near the beginning stages of the pandemic, a couple of decades ago, it feels like. Uh, I'll share those slides with you. Just a variety of active learning activities that could be used. Um, and, and I think we, I'm sure we have a video of that somewhere. Um, and going back to here, um, oh, actually, I did put together, in case you find any of this useful, um, I'm just going to put this in the chat. Um, and these will be, this is a link to the slides, which also has a link to the other presentation. So a flipped classroom approach can be really productive. It relies on active learning, which we know is much more effective. Um, it often doesn't work as well the first time you try it, uh, and it gets better the more often you do it. One of the problems that 
many people have had is they try something and it doesn't work. But, you know, the first time we try anything, it may not work as well. And, you know, it takes some time and practice to become better at it. Any other thoughts, reactions, concerns, suggestions? I'd like to share one thing. Um, I've been, I'm teaching a course in the English department. Uh, it's my third iteration of the class. It's called the writing portfolio. And it's very unusual in that students have to take essays they've already written and rewrite them. So I have no control really over content, which makes it a potentially very diffuse kind of course. Um, and I've done a lot of in-class activity, but what I was, I've been thinking very hard about why it doesn't translate. And I realized it's because I sort of, you know, rely on the wax on, wax off model. Cobra Kai is back, Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi is on my mind, but it doesn't just translate, right? So I've been thinking very deeply about this. And I realized that they, students need to, to be compelled to make choices and make decisions and demonstrate, like it doesn't have to be on a full scale, but from week to week, that's what I'll be doing is they're going to do the in-class activity. And then they're going to have a few days to process that. And then they have to report what decision they make. The decisions are not irreversible, but or they are reversible, but they need to move forward. They have simply not moved forward uh, uh, in the process. So for me, the in-class activity needs this kind of other, I don't know, articulation to the projects or it just doesn't work. So mm -hmm. I'll be trying that and maybe next semester I can do something to report on it. I was gonna say, next time you could present on this. <laughs> yeah. That is challenging. Um, and again, students resist revision quite, as, as you know, probably more than I do because in writing that's an issue. Any other comments, thoughts? I have a question. Sure. Um, any suggestions for using this with grad students? I was trained, I think, in as a grad student to be part of the flipped classroom, read the materials, come in, be ready to talk. But I think a lot of that was self-motivation because people who didn't want to talk didn't. And, um, and it was a great way to learn the material. But how well, to instill you, that, you know? Well, you know, one thing that I remember I didn't realize it at the time, and this just refreshed it. One of my graduate courses, it was a second year course, a field course, um, had us read papers outside of class, and then we'd have to present them. But we never knew who would be called on to present them. So we always had to be prepared. And that's that's a strategy that you could use. Or, but, or if you want to be a little bit nicer about it, you could have students do presentations in the class and let them present on it. And that's a really good way of, of flipping things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to do that in my music theory classes where I'd say, okay, you get to explain this certain concept to the class next week. And boy, that got them working hard. <laughs> and you can divide it up. So, yeah. you know, each group, you may have small groups or they may be individuals where a number of students will be presenting each class period. And that's a good way of flipping the class environment. And it, it tends to build a whole lot more engagement and a much deeper level of knowledge. You know, because if you have to present on something, you're going to learn it much more deeply than if you just skimmed it over to be ready to be asked questions in class or something similar. I've been doing the same thing in my senior capstone course where students do presentations every week, and that's been really helpful. They end up learning of things so much more deeply than I've seen in other classes. Thanks. Okay, um, well, I'll stop the recording. Um, and...